It's now been about three weeks since I established this little sealed ecosphere comprising a random scoop of water, sediment and weed collected from a local pond. This week has seen what I think is the most exciting development of all. So today we'll be looking at that plus some new footage and updates on organisms we already saw. I won't keep you waiting too long to hear the most exciting news, but just a couple of quick points first. Most importantly, I'm very grateful for the attention and positive feedback that this series has attracted. And I'm really delighted that people found it inspiring or informative, or just relaxing in this difficult time we're all going through. If you're thinking about replicating this experiment yourself, please do not violate any lockdown protocols that may be in place in your locality. I am fortunate enough to pass this swampy little pond on my regular dog walking route, on my single permitted exercise outing each day. The other important point is not to violate any of your local wildlife protection statutes. We'll get to why I mention this right now. So as I said, there was a hugely exciting discovery in my little jar this week, and this is what it was. I just happened to be looking at the jar, and I saw what I thought was a small fish. But on closer examination, it turned out to be a tadpole. Tadpoles, also known in some parts of the world by the name polywogs, are the larval stage of amphibians such as frogs, toads and salamanders. I imagine this one must have arrived as an egg attached to a piece of weed and perhaps only just hatched out in the past few days or so. So there it is, a vertebrate in the jar. Now, I did say right at the start of this project that if this happened I would consider returning the contents of the jar to the pond. And I still think that's the right thing to do. Before we do that, we'll take a closer look at this remarkable little amphibian. And before that, let's look at a couple of other things I observed during the week. Firstly, the crustaceans in the jar. A viewer was kind enough to contact me and assist with the identification of some of these, which I've been getting a bit wrong sometimes. One crustacean that I mistook for Daphnia in the previous videos is this one, which is actually an ostracod, a different family of small crustaceans. This one appears to be either stuck or deliberately trying to graze a biofilm or algae on the surface of the glass. But this allows us an opportunity to look at it more closely while it's comparatively still. Ostracods have an outer shell that's superficially similar to a clamshell, with their limbs working in a narrow opening between the two halves. This one appears to be drawing water in and filtering it. Here we can see a particle of food being taken in and retained. This one was perilously close to a hydra, and I think it's only the fact that the hydra's tentacle got hung up on something else that saved this little ostracod from becoming the hydra's breakfast. Copepod crustaceans are still fairly abundant in the jar, and after considerable fiddling and messing around, I managed to get some fairly good close-ups of one of them as it rested briefly on the inside of the glass. So we're looking at it from its underside, although that's pretty moot for an animal as transparent as this one. Most copepods have a single central eye. In fact, there's one genus of copepods called cyclops for this precise reason. These crustaceans are really difficult to capture with the microscope because they keep darting about, but here's a moment when this one was staying still. They have a body plan consisting of a domed head with a segmented thorax and tail, with lots of small limbs underneath. Sort of like a scaled down horseshoe crab. I managed to get a good, close look at the worm-like organism that's been something of a mystery up until now. At higher magnification we can actually see it has a segmented body, but it's not a segmented worm. This is actually an insect probably the larva of a midge or something similar. The hydra are still around, however they have stopped reproducing by budding and are now all sporting these translucent sexual reproductive organs. I believe this change in reproductive behaviour may indicate a worsening shortage of food for them. These animals are immortal, but not indestructible. That is, they will not die of old age as long as conditions remain favourable. But if food becomes scarce or conditions are otherwise not suitable, the adult hydra may die from those causes. 
Their eggs, however, are very durable and can lay dormant a long time, until conditions improve again. When the eggs hatch, the animal that first emerges is a free swimming form called a medusa, a microscopically tiny jellyfish. I was hoping to capture footage of this, but I don't think it's happening in the jar right now. One other interesting thing I spotted while this hydra was repositioning itself is a tiny life form of some kind moving on the outside of the hydra's body. I don't know what this thing is, or whether it's there as a parasite or a commensal organism, or if it just happens to be there purely by chance because the hydra's body is a convenient surface. The jar appears to be growing a variety of different algae now, here on the inside of a glass, but also in filaments or strands suspended in the water. I saw these little oblong brownish-green things all over the place on the inside of the glass, floating in the water and up at the surface. I don't know what these are. They might be excreta from one of the animals in the jar, or maybe some kind of algae. The roots of the duckweed grew quite a long way down into the water, and all of this weed seemed to be quite busy with small crustaceans. The flatworms climb up the side of the glass and then weave their way through the weed and roots, presumably hunting and eating the crustaceans. But the highlight of the week was, of course, this little tadpole. Let's go back for a closer look at it. We can very easily identify head, eyes, gills and tail. I'm pretty certain this is the tadpole of a newt of some kind, that is, a salamander that will live most of its life in water. I say it's a newt because of the elongated body that's forming here. In the tadpole of a frog or toad, most of this part would just be the tail, but here we can see internal organs distributed in an elongated body. Looking closer at this animal, we can see some amazing details. Firstly, we can see right inside its body to its beating heart. We can see limbs forming. Here's the right foreleg, on which several toes are already developing. And behind the limb, at least from our view of the underside of this animal, these feathery structures are the gills. Looking really closely, we can actually see the blood cells circulating inside the gills, exchanging oxygen with the water. And this is where I've hit an ethical and possibly legal problem with the continuation of this project. It seems most unlikely that this little jar would sustain the proper development of this precious little amphibian. There's possibly not enough oxygen in there, almost certainly not enough food. So I cannot in good faith keep it captive here, only to watch it starve or suffocate. This might seem like an odd stance after having been perfectly happy to keep crustaceans, flatworms, hydra and other organisms captive. But this is a vertebrate which will develop into a larger adult with a much more complex nervous system than anything else we've seen in here. The other organisms in the jar are living pretty normal lives, oblivious to their captivity. But in this small space, that would not be possible for an amphibian. Newts are also protected animals in the UK. I would actually be committing a crime by deliberately harming this animal. If this were the rare great crested newt, which has the greatest level of protection, just the simple act of keeping it captive would be against the law. For the smooth newt, which I think this one is, it's illegal to harm or deliberately collect them. These laws don't exist without a reason, so here's what I did. I took the jar back to the pond where I made the original collection. Now, it's important not to just dump the contents of the jar straight back into the pond. The water temperature and levels of oxygen and various other dissolved chemicals may be quite different between the pond and the jar by now. So to just tip it straight in could shock the organisms inside and harm them. So I opened the jar, immersed it partially in the water, then gradually, over the course of about an hour, added very small amounts of fresh pond water into it, a little bit at a time. I would have preferred to do this balancing with the rest of the pond over a much longer period, but during the current lockdown it would be unreasonable to stay outside that long. So I had to do the best job I could in the limited time. At the end of the hour, I carefully laid the jar down in the pond and left it there to allow the organisms to exit gently at their own pace. 
The following day I returned and retrieved the jar, making sure it was properly empty before taking it home. It's possible that some of the hydra and other small organisms were still on the glass, but the newt was back in the pond. Ironically, it will be exposed to much greater danger of predation in the pond than it would in captivity. But this is where it belongs. Now I realise how disappointing it might seem that this Ecosphere series has come to an end after just three weeks. I intended it to last much longer. But don't worry, I plan to repeat this experiment with water from different sources very soon. As this journey, although brief, has been a most remarkable one. Don't forget to check out the channel Life in Jars where I got the inspiration to try this. There's a link together with some other interesting stuff in the video description. I hope this has been interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.